today's guests are Terry Thaxton, John Brandenburg. We join their conversation in the faculty lounge. And, um, like the book opens at a scientific conference mm -hmm. where um, oh, I, I have made the discovery and I'm not, it, it turns out I was not the first person to make this discovery that not only is the CO2 level in the atmosphere rising because we're burning all these fossil fuels, right. the oxygen level is dropping. It's only dropping mm. uh, parts per million per year. We have a lot of parts per million. I mean, there's no danger of running out of oxygen mm -hmm. um, unless we get really stupid. But uh, we... The, the book opens with me presenting this scientific paper at a convention, scientific mm -hmm. convention, and having all these people come and look at it and say, oh my God, that's terrible. You know, other mm -hmm. scientists right. and, and uh, people looking at it and then running away, oh, God. apparently to tell other people. Oh, and, sure. Um, and then finally, this tall... Danish scientist came up smiling smugly. <laughs> he says, oh yes, we've measured this effect. It's right within mm -hmm. our predictions. And I said, well, we assumed it's dropping like seven parts per million per year. What did you measure? And he just smiled, walked away. He mm. wouldn't tell me. Oh. But it's dropping like 10 parts per million per year. Oh, is it? So we've <laughs> we have crossed a threshold um, and you know, I got to do real kind of science on the front line and to feel what it feels like also to discover something that's not good news scientifically. Right. And not even have anybody dispute it. In fact, have people say, oh, yeah, we know that about that, but we're keeping it quiet because we don't want people right. asking a lot of questions like, what are we going to do now? Right. <laughs> We wouldn't want that. We wouldn't want that. Mm, that but might lead to a fix. That might lead to a fix. That's right. <laughs> uh, oh, it was um, um, one of the other things we did in the books. You know, we st this it started out actually looking at this what looks like a carved face on Mars where it shouldn't right. be, and, right. and about ten kilometers away, by the way, there's a pyramid, a five-sided pyramid. So you've got a face and a pyramid looks like, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it looks suspiciously like archaeology on a planet that we are, we are assured there is no archaeology on Mars. Right, because Be there was no life. Because there was no life and uh, on and on. And then you find this stuff and people get very annoyed with you if you bring that up. Mm -hmm. And um, so finally uh, people got so annoyed they said, we're going to send a spacecraft to Mars and we're going to take another picture of this thing and show you that it's not a face and a pyramid. The thing that looks like a face and a pyramid, they don't look like that. Uh, so they sent this spacecraft called Mars Observer to Mars. Right. And I was talking with a colleague the day before it was supposed to go in orbit around Mars and take this big picture. Mm -hmm. And I said, I was, his name's Vince. And I said, Vince, we're finally going to, we've, we, we've accomplished it. All we wanted them to do was take another picture. That's right. what the, all this is about. Just get, get us more information. Right. And now it's finally going to happen. You should be really proud. And he said, he says, oh, John, I don't think so. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> uh -oh. I think they can't just go take that picture for some reason. Mm -hmm. That would be too simple. Mm -hmm. And he said, I, I have a feeling for some reason we're not going to see any pictures that they take. And the next day the spacecraft just disappeared like it was swallowed by a giant goldfish out there. Mm -hmm. And it was just stunning to see, you know, Jet Propulsion Lab had never lost a spacecraft in deep space, except at Mars when it was supposed to take this big picture. That was going to disprove. That was going to disprove mm -hmm. this. So, right. of course, everyone went crazy. And, uh, but for uh, us who had been close to investigation and had actually talked to NASA people who said, well, uh, you've raised some interesting points. We're going to, of course, take another picture and to see them Right. 
completely baffled and helpless that they themselves didn't know what had happened to the spacecraft. I asked somebody, I said, well, what do you think has happened to the spacecraft? And he says, well, how many ways can you interpret no signal? <laughs> <laughs> it was, it literally, the spacecraft had said, I'm turning off my radio now so I can do this rocket blast, and I'll call you back when it's over to tell you how it went. And then they kept waiting and waiting and waiting for basically it to phone home. Mm -hmm. It never did. Never has. It was like it was like a great novel. Yeah, <laughs> great murder mystery, <laughs> cliffhanger. <laughs> a cliffhanger, <laughs> and um, so. But you, you know, you're a writer yourself. What mm -hmm. uh, what is the, the theme of your poetry? Do you think myself? <laughs> well, we have to begin with what we know, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> but uh, you know, you had. Uh, we were speaking of the Cold War earlier. You had this a ringside seat on the great dramas of the Cold War here in Florida, because you're a Florida native. Right, well... The Cuban Missile Crisis and the Apollo program. Right, but I think during my childhood I was, um, you know, so self-absorbed that I sure. didn't pay much attention to, to those things. So I'm just beginning to really start reading about the times when I live, that I've lived through. Oh. Um, and my second collection of poems that I'm working on now, um, the poems are more focused on Florida and oh. Florida fauna and flora and mm. um, ornithology and uh, landscape and all of that. So that's uh, to me more interesting than the first book, which is really... <laughs> <laughs> well. But, you know, I mean, the writers always say that the favorite writing is what we're working on now, so. Right, right. I prefer what I'm working on now to, I do like the title of the first book. What, what so. is it? Getaway Girl. The Getaway Girl, yeah. uh oh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you must have been hell as a teenage daughter. Right, right. <laughs> well, that was it. Oh. But I'm also working on a novel. Oh, I see. Um, and that's almost finished. Oh, fabulous. What's, what's it about, if you can talk about it? I know uh, lots of writers don't like to talk about exactly what they're doing because I it know. drains off the energy. Um, yeah, I don't think I want to talk about Okay, <laughs> I understand. I, the title is The Man I'm Looking For. Oh. And so it's really focused on a, um, a teenage girl who thinks she knows her father but doesn't um, oh. until after he's dead. And then she begins to research <clears throat> and discover secrets of his life that are really similar to the types of men that she's fascinating that, that she's interested in. Oh, that's very interesting. Because she thinks all the men she's dating are different from her father, <laughs> and she can't figure out why they're like they are until she begins to research her father and discovers they are in fact exactly like her father but she didn't oh, for know heaven's sake she didn't know him that's that's quite interesting so i'm really trying to layer several things mm. with that and of course it happens to take place in florida but well write about what you know right because you can write most meaningfully about that right right you can really get into that i had uh the novel i wrote i had part of it um you know, that is distinct from this book, which was a science book. I wrote a novel mm -hmm. uh, recently and got it published. Um, and it's it's about the collapse. It's a science fiction novel. It's about mm -hmm. the collapse of the UFO cover-up. And I had part of it occur in my hometown in Oreg Medford, Oregon, mm -hmm. which is a place out west. Right. And many of the characters, a lot of it occurs in Colorado, where the government has allowed the aliens from outer space to move into a mesa, just like Close Encounters, mm. the third kind. Mm -hmm. Imagine Close Encounters, the third kind, the meeting between the government and the aliens that occurred. Right. And then the government, in complete secrecy, has allowed the aliens to move into this that Devil's Tower mesa right. and establish a base there. And mm -hmm. the, the aliens are supposed to give us all this good stuff, death rays, nuclear, you know, all, all sorts of things governments like, you mm -hmm. know, new weapons, new technologies, um, uh, mind-reading technology. They want, the government was big on that. Mm -hmm. And 
now 30 years have gone by, nothing like that. The aliens have not really given much as, <laughs> as much of anything of value. All they have done is cause trouble. Mm -hmm. They have been abducting people. They have been uh, mutilating the cattle around there, and the local ranchers are actually paying host to a bunch of aliens from outer space mm -hmm. who have strange customs. And um, they're livid. And what I have then is a novel that combines a bunch of scientists and secret government types and intelligence types and mm -hmm. and and uh, aliens from outer space with cowboys like I grew up with. Oh right, sure. And just their f common folk wisdom and and, right. uh, and the ranchers towards the end of the novel, just as things are starting to come apart in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. The cover-up is unraveling. Mm -hmm. Congress is investigating. The FBI is investigating. Um, even the Army is investigating, which is essentially an Air Force project. And mm -hmm. and um, and these two women news anchors are risking their lives to basically push this story forward. Mm -hmm. And um, in the middle of all that, these ranchers succeed in shooting down a flying saucer over the rangeland oh, at night. And the mm -hmm. next morning, there are 200 armed ranchers with high-powered rifles waiting on this hilltop with this crashed saucer mm -hmm. with dead aliens, a half-mutilated cow, human, obviously American intelligence types in black uniforms dead in the wreckage. And they're standing around and this one character rides up on his horse and gets off and turns to one of the other characters sitting there leaning on his rifle, and, he's, and he says to him, he says, well, Chuck, looks like you had it figured right all along. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> on the other side of the mountain, by the way, the secret government forces in black are moving up troops to try and retake the saucer before the news people can get there. Mm -hmm. So you have all of the opportunity for, you know, this great collision between kind of traditional American values of ruggedness, self-reliance, the kind of cowboy virtues. Um, and I grew up around people like that. And this very secretive, uh, uh, I know all the reasons for everything that's happening, but I can't tell you because it's mm -hmm. a matter of national security. Right. National security covers. Right, lots of conflict. Right, Sounds lots like of a, conflict. Yeah. And finally, when they cover up, you know, and, the, and this happens at the same time, everything's unraveling in Washington, D.C., in congressional hearings, and mm -hmm. um, finally, um, unlike Watergate or Iran Countergate, two um, government scandals I got to work, look at at close range in Washington, D.C., especially around Countergate, uh, in this novel, the government, uh, the Congress demands the president turn over information about this, and mm. he uh, goes on TV and declares martial law and declares Congress to be in recess oh, wow. because he says this matter is too important to be left up to the political machinations of this Congress. Mm. And troops in black take control of the bridges over the Potomac, and the military is told to stay in the barracks. Wow. But it sounds great. And so this is already published? Yes, this is published. And the title, what's the title of this Morning book? Star Pass, The Collapse of the UFO Cover-Up. Morning Star is a town, okay. a mythical town in Colorado mm -hmm. that unwittingly has been chosen by the government mm -hmm. to, be, to play host to these uh, little gray aliens from outer space. Right. And, um, and um, I tried to make this scientifically authentic, you know, right. and if you accept the premise of, of intelligent life from elsewhere. And, right. And um, it's, uh, I, you know, as you know, we write basically almost to speak to ourselves. Right, yeah, to make Which sense to, of to make our own world. Yeah. To make sense of our own world. And I found yeah. that uh, I had done this basically to try and make sense out of the UFO. Um, Phenomenon, right, and and also the question of extraterrestrial intelligence. You know, what would it really mean if we were in contact with them? Right. And um, uh, interesting, I took the premise in the book that 
that there's an assumption in SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, that goes, it's called the assumption of mediocrity. Mm. The assumption that the human race in the cosmos is mediocre. Right. That it is neither, uh, <laughs> it's somewhere between angels and devils. Right. And right. Somewhere in between. Right. And I took, made the assumption that the aliens from outer space, of which there are several types, but there's one type that is set up shop in this mesa, mm -hmm. Devil's Mesa. Uh, and what the real secret is, is they're pretty much like we are. And with all... Oh, the good, because they're often portrayed, you know, as you say, either one way or the other. Absolutely. Usually as devilish. Either angels or devils. Usually more devilish. And in this one, they are pretty much like human beings, essentially. Mediocre. And, and they're, yeah, they're, medi they're, they're also mediocrity. So you have two <laughs> mediocre species <laughs> dealing with each other in a mediocre manner, finally. And, uh, right. and you know, the miscommunications, uh, the, the misunderstandings, and uh, I even have the aliens speak mm -hmm. about what they are involved in. And one of them says, you know, no one on our planet knows what we're doing here. Oh. Our own government doesn't tell us anything. Wow. They, or, he said, I volunteered to come here, he tells the heroine. <laughs> <laughs> I volunteered. <laughs> I was stupid enough to volunteer to come here uh -huh. and was told that the humans would welcome us with welcome arms uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> and um, that we would teach them a new and better way to live. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So it's, uh, well, uh, one other thing about... Uh, but it sounds like fun because, or also a, a nice way to balance what you do. Yes. Because there's this very scientific side. Yes. And then having a creative outlet is also... Well, and scientists are creative by nature, so, or well, we, by definition, I think. Well, but. I think there's a creative spark in everybody. And yes. science, it tends to be very much channeled, and you try to discipline it. But my experience of science has been that uh, um, science is just as an emotional and political, um, yeah. and, and is, is just as ridden with the political milieu that we're in mm -hmm. is uh, just about any other aspect mm -hmm. of life. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, there, I, I belong to this one organization, and I, I would, it was my first job out of graduate school. This was the laboratory, the late great mm -hmm. adventure out in the desert with the you know, right. and uh, I. I coined the phrase from that that I said, well, this, the organization I joined uh, was the General Motors of Science, <laughs> 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 with all that that portends. And, right. and I said, I learned that there were written rules in that organization and there were unwritten rules. Mm -hmm. If you broke the written rules, you could be forgiven. But if you broke the unwritten rules, especially if you broke one or two of the really important ones, uh, then there was no hope for you. Right. Uh, and, uh, and eventually, it's a good lesson to learn early on. Yes, I, <laughs> I was very chagrined uh, to. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, it was a very, it was a very good experience mm -hmm. to work there, and, um, and but I, I, you know, I did, I did learn a great deal about, uh, uh, not to hang, you know, at least by that time I had learned not to hang any rainbow prisms in my office window. Right, right. And uh, the, the other poor fellow hadn't learned that. And, um, but in your next job, you decided. Yes, my next what job. What the heck? I'll hang my. What the heck? <laughs> um, yeah, the place yeah. I worked, I worked. I had gone to graduate school at kind of a university setting at another government lab, but it was run by a university, mm -hmm. and um, people were very fond of putting all sorts of cartoons and stuff like that on their doors. Right. So I put some cartoons on my door, and uh, immediately they were. One of my colleagues oh. said, take those things down, Brambrig. You're not allowed to put anything on the door of your office here. Oh, but there were other doors with cartoons. On. No, actually there weren't. Oh. And uh, because I had, I had been at one place where, which was run by a university. So it was very much like a university setting, big mm -hmm. campus. Mm -hmm. But this new place out in the desert was run by Bell Labs, which is an industrial oh. 
uh, it was run by Ma Bell. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. Remember Ma Bell? <laughs> I remember her. Ma, Ma Bell, and uh, there, no cartoons on the doors were allowed. And mm -hmm. I w came into work early one morning, and I, I started, I started getting paranoid there. And I, for I had this, I'd been there for about three years, and I started. I started really kind of getting paranoid feelings, like people were going through my office at night. Mm -hmm. So I had straightened up my office, just on a premonition. I came in the next morning, and someone had pasted post-it notes. Post-it notes had just been invented, then, or, or something <coughs> like a post-it note, and uh, maybe they were just taped to the door, and 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 uh, they taped notes. Uh, this office looks like a pig pen. Clean it up. <laughs> And they, somebody had gone around and pasted notes on, not my door, but other of my colleagues there who had mm -hmm. were kind of creative types and kept a messy desk. Right. And I had cleaned up mine, thank God, and stacked everything neatly. And and so they, uh, I t I took the notes down and told my friends that these notes had ended up on their door, mm -hmm. and they. Uh, they said, gee, the only person who normally does this is away in Washington, D.C., <laughs> so I wonder who's doing this. <laughs> Apparently, this was common practice oh my for God. people to come through and rifle people's offices at night, and they said the guards would come through, and they would try all the safes, and people kept classifying information. It was for right. security, and they would try all the safes, and they would open the desk drawers to see if the combinations were in there, and, and it was... So I, I don't know. Well, it, it, was, it was a fine place for people of a certain kind of mindset, but right. not somebody who would like to write science fiction novels. I yeah. <laughs> so so oh, have you, my. have you, uh, what, what was your background before you came to, into academia? Uh, well, I didn't start college until I was 29. Oh. So I spent my 20s figuring out what it was to be an adult, and then I started college, did college for 10 years, and then um, started teaching. I taught wow. high school for a couple of years, public high school for a couple of years. Wow. Thinking that, you know, the security might be the thing for me. And while the security was nice, um, <laughs> I, I wasn't, <laughs> it That's wasn't for me. That's a pretty rough tour of duty. It was, yeah, it was a rough tour of duty. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. And so I, um, so then I came uh, to UCF. To teach, because that's what I've always wanted to do, was teach. Oh, very good. And then writing just sort like of came out, it. came out oh, of it. Just came out of it. Oh, it came out of it. Yeah. And then, well, actually, when I started college, I was going to major in psychology. Interesting. And then I took English courses, and I thought, oh, that's more interesting than, to me than psychology. Mm -hmm. And because I can make things up. <laughs> <laughs> it's called confabulation yes, in psychology. Yes, right, right, and and still get to analyze things, and so I kind of just stuck with that. And um, but recently, I've been working more on the service learning um, initiative at UCF, mm -hmm. and so all of my classes, my students have to do service learning, and I do it with them, so. I've learned to shift my research, not to include not only my own writing, but to use my applied research in teaching um, underprivileged I see. literacy skills. So I'm working at the Coalition for the Homeless Very with good. kids, oh. which is really fun mm. and fascinating. And um, a couple summers ago, I worked at a private correctional facility which Interesting. I didn't know they existed, and that was fun. Who puts them, people, in private correctional facility, if I might yeah, ask? Yeah, well, because I, I did, because I wrote an essay about Is it, because I thought it was very interesting. Is there a private justice system? Or? Yes, it's a, well, it's, it's, the government pays private businesses ah. to run correctional facilities, and um, they sell it to the um, inmates, uh, in government prisons as a way to transition back into the real world. Oh. So they serve the last 10% of their sentence at the private correctional facility with certain stipulations that they have to look for a job, they have to go to counseling, they have to do rehabilitation skills, 
training, mm. which is where, and I somehow was able to convince the director that creative writing was a skill. Oh, it is a great s and, tool for self-analysis. Right. Well, and also most of them were really at about ninth grade level in terms of writing. Yeah. So rather than walk in and say, okay, we're going to write an essay, <laughs> we're going to write, I tell them we're going to write a short story. And so they're able to use their own experience to write. And it doesn't matter what they're writing, just so they're practicing mm -hmm. writing. And I remember my my first night there, I gave them a poetry exercise. That's why it's me in the room with 20 felons. And so I gave them a little poetry exercise to, to do, and one of the men was heckling me and kept saying, this can't be, you can't be a university professor. This is silly stuff. This doesn't, this isn't going to teach us anything. And so I went over and I tried to explain to him how, you know, I was trying to do something that was not intimidating, that would um, get into people's imaginations without them knowing I was getting to their imaginations. And he wasn't having any of it. He just kept saying, this is baloney. I'm not going to do any of this. Things. Eventually, one of the other guys says, <laughs> Shut up, Mike, we're trying to write a poem. <laughs> and I said, yeah, shut up. <laughs> well. So I thought we were going to have a fight over they're going to write poems. <laughs> but it was a. Sounds like a great literary moment. Yeah, it was. And it was a fun experience to watch them mm -hmm. because they didn't trust me at first. No. They thought I was paid by the facility to be there, and then they thought I was paid by the university to be there. They thought I was a secret agent of some sort. I see. Eventually, 